everyone and welcome to First Steps in Content Commerce, creating your retail lookbook. Today with us we have Artus, a pro our product marketing manager. Nice to be here. And uh, myself, Cesar, customer success manager here at Contentful. Today's agenda has a first uh, presentation. Uh, it's a short 10 minute presentation about what we're going to, uh, you know, about the themes that we're going to approach. And uh, afterwards, we will actually show you the content model, uh, not only how to create one yourself, uh, but also how that then translates uh, into, you know, a complete website. And uh, by the end of the webinar, we'll have then a short Q&A. So let's start with what exactly works for e-commerce. We actually interviewed a lot of our e-commerce customers, and we realized that there are four main points that actually work for e-commerce. Um, these strategies are uh, obviously, you know, backed by content. So, you know, with content, you can actually um, enrich in your, your product description. So you can enhance the buying experience by adding, you know, more detailed product descriptions, even, you know, inline uh, images and so forth. Um, lookbooks uh, to drive um, inspiration. Um, the use of video, so a better, a better display of video inside of your, um, of your shopping cart. So essentially, you know, how, this, how would a, a specific product look when used in real life or, you know, if it's clothing, how it would look like on a person. And um, user-generated content, uh, so essentially reviewing, um, uh, sorry, highlighting reviews, Instagram pictures, and etc. of, you know, people, real people using these products. Now, Artis, why don't you tell us a bit more about the content models that we've been uh, talking about? Oh, thank you for the introduction, Cesar. Um, so, as Cesar has mentioned, uh, today, uh, cutting-edge e-commerce companies, they employ very different strategies in order to uh, drive sales and attract traffic and, you know, enhance their brand. And what we would like to do is actually look in more detail into a lookbook uh, strategy. And uh, for those of you who are new to the term, Lookbook basically uh, refers to a very visual um, presentation of uh, brand's products, uh, which is not per se selling, but more setting the context, uh, also highlighting uh, ambassadors, uh, showing how this product is used in context, uh, by what kind of demographics and people and so on. And the distinguishing factor is that uh, very often uh, the lookbooks are accompanied by, you know, high quality fashion photography. Um, they have professional content writers uh, uh, writing the text and so on. Sometimes they incorporate uh, other media like uh, slider or videos or, you know, uh, some stuff connected from internet like tweets and, and um, Instagram photos and stuff like that. Um, and the distinguishing feature is actually that every single lookbook is a unique in itself. It brings something new and fresh um, to people who are looking at the, at the lookbook at the same time, you know, projecting the spirit and the, um, the, the values of a, of a bigger brand. So that's basically what the lookbook is. And um, since it happened to be such a challenging thing to execute in practice, we thought uh, a lot of our um, users would benefit from knowing a little bit more what are typical strategies employed by big successful companies in order um, to model the content which can support very flexible and at the same time reusable uh, lookbooks. Uh, before we go uh, into specifics of that though, I would like to make a short introduction and highlight some of the key points which actually make it so easy to create um, things like lookbooks on Contentful. Um, so differently from a lot of other CMSs which are out there, one thing that we don't do, we don't really make any assumptions about the type of content you're going to be creating. So whereas when you download and install WordPress, uh, it's already pre-configured and ready to go uh, for you to create blog posts, right? And that means there's always, always uh, a certain structure already built into WordPress. Uh, for us, it's a bit different, you know, since we don't know how our customers will use it, uh, what we do instead, we make it very simple to come up with a structure that fits your needs. And that's, this is basically what we call content modeling. So it's that step in the uh, content creation process where you determine uh, which reusable templates you're going to be using, uh, which fields go into specific templates, 
uh, as for fields and what type of fields it will be. And then you kind of build it all together once so that editors who are creating actual content can just reuse that structure over and over again. Uh, and with this said, um, let's look now uh, what are specific you know, uh, goals that we need to achieve when we are creating a logbook. So I think one very important task is, is actually to, uh, to do a good job in defining the so-called Lego bricks or like the smallest units of content that you will have. Uh, the challenge here is like how to make sure that you are not really going into details and let's say um, having every single author name as a, as a separate entry but rather, you know, have meaningful chunks. Uh, so sometimes it's just like having old information which relates to author and then old information which relates to a certain category and then maybe, you know, a certain type of entry, like all those could be uh, standalone content types. Then the second thing that you often need to do is uh, you need to figure out what kind of presentation options editors should have. Um, we know that in traditional CMSs, for example, uh, because they uh, employ what you see is what you get type of text editors. Um, editors often feel that they are in control of how the content is going to be presented uh, to the end user. Of course, that is not true because what happens is that uh, we see weak editors, they give you a very simplified view of your content. So the moment you start going into a different browser or opening your content on a mobile uh, or maybe you know trying to look it up on a, on a big plasma screen TV, uh, that's where the presentation breaks down and you start seeing all kinds of um, bad things that are hiding in, in this uh, markup code that we see with editors use. Uh, Contentful, by contrast, uh, uses markdown, which prevents all those bad things from happening and makes sure that the content is much more portable, which means like you can use it for websites, but at the same time, it's easily reusable for mobile and smartwatches and uh, TVs and in-car entertainment systems and why, whatnot. Uh, so the bigger question here is, you know, stepping away from just uh, uh, formatting versus non-formatting uh, of text. Uh, how do you present editors with meaningful uh, styling and formatting options that help them to do their job as opposed to limit uh, how far the content can travel across the platforms. And then the last thing is that you need to remember that Logbooks is actually um, a piece of content marketing, right? So there is a certain commercial goal behind it. And then that goal is actually highlight merchandise within context. Uh, what happens is that uh, the best uh, of breed companies who are you know, actively engaged in producing Logbooks, they fuse the products and the context and you know uh, some lifestyle shots and, and stories and stuff like that in a very smooth way uh, to the point where you know readers are actually looking forward to discover new products this way uh, so again the challenge here is like how do you do that on a you know content level how do you make sure that your products are not just existing there by themselves in the shop but also very easy to cross-reference and to integrate into the lookbooks that you are creating uh, and basically in our presentation we'll be looking at all those um, problems and suggesting some of the ways you can uh, address them. So to make it uh, much more tangible and usable, what we try to do is we try to um, investigate two different um, types of logbooks and we chose Mr. Porter, a company based in London, UK and Nasty Girl, uh, up and rising uh, fashion label from LA in, in California. Uh, because both of those companies uh, do lookbooks right. And what I mean here, it's not only the fact that every time they publish a new lookbook, it looks fresh and uh, authentic and, you know, uh, actually promotes the, the sales, uh, but it's also that they are doing it on a very regular basis. Uh, and that is a very big caveat because uh, anybody could pretty much, you know, uh, do a lookbook once a year by throwing some development resources at that. But the real challenge here is how do you set up your your working space and how do you select your tools in a way that allows your editors to create this original content from week to week or from month to month without actually involving too much the development side uh, of your company. So that is the problem that we are dealing with. And we think that uh, both of these companies, Mr. Porter and Nasty Girl, they actually solve this company in a very efficient way, which is why it makes sense to look at them as uh, good examples. <clears throat> So let's start by looking uh, at a typical lookbook um, published by Nasty Girl. 
Uh, here you see Lena Dunham visiting the headquarters of a company and having impromptu photo shoot there. Um, I just pasted a few sections of a really long lookbook here uh, so that we could, you know, uh, get an impression of, you know, how it looks like in practice. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's very varied, you know, so sometimes you have like this full bleed uh, pictures which just uh, show Lena wearing a specific you know, type of clothes. Other times you will just have a quote, you know, or a combo where you see like a few smaller pictures and stuff like that. And uh, one thing maybe it's not so obvious right now just by looking at this static snapshot, but as you navigate through this page and you hover over specific pictures, you would also see um, highlights of the products that uh, people are wearing in the picture. And just by clicking on those products, you can immediately go to the shopping page and then add it to your cart. So the question is, when you have something like this, which is visual, uh, you know, interesting layout, uh, looks very original and stuff like that, how would you start even thinking about modeling something like that in your backend? And to make the task easier, what I did is actually I turned this page into uh, this schema of uh, different types of contents that you have. So uh, on one hand you have this gray blocks which basically uh, you know, symbolize specific sections of a lookbook and then with each, each section you also have you know, some smaller units. So you have a slot with a text, you know, a slot with a photo. Uh, you also have specific products cross-referenced to those slots. Um, so I just tried to depict that all in a very graphic manner. Um, so you would start seeing the connection between the visual part and how it could be represented, you know, in terms of content structure. If we go one step further, uh, you can see that here we have, you know, pure content types. So basically, once you're creating your content model, that would be separate, you know, types of entities that you would create in the back end in order to handle all of that. Um, we will go um, deeper into each of those and explain what they do and stuff like that. But for now, I just wanted you know to show you like this hierarchy, so you could see, uh, for example, how many content types you need to have to support you know a lookbook like this, and how do they relate between themselves. An alternative approach would be something that comes from Mr. Porter. So here again, uh, we see Mr. Porter interviewing a few uh, trendy men from Amsterdam dog owners uh, kind of playing on the theme of uh, how you treat your pet and stuff like that but at the same time uh, showing off some of the you know clothes that you can buy on the website uh, this lookbook is slightly simpler in its structure because it basically combines two basic elements it's blocks of text and then you have you know a, a picture uh, as well as some products you know cross-referenced in the picture Again, uh, the lookbook is interactive, so if you would hover over pictures, that's when you would see uh, specific products and you can click on them and add them to your shopping cart and so on. Uh, and then, again, the question is like, how would you start modeling this in the back end? So, uh, to repeat the same thing, I broke it down into specific sections. And here you would immediately see that like, okay, uh, header section is a bit different from everything else. But otherwise, you have a you know, section with a photo, and then you have different sections with text. Uh, and again, for simplicity's sake, you could, for example, distinguish between text where you just introduce a character and then a follow-up text where you actually paste an interview with a character. Again, if we simplify it and, and try to show it as pure content types, uh, you see that uh, the structure is slightly different from the one we saw in Nasty Girl. Uh, but in principle, we have, you know, again, three different layers. Uh, and we will look in a second what those layers represent. So I think at this point, uh, we are through with introductory remarks. And then now we can actually move inside of Contentful and see how those things are actually working in practice. Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction. Um, now that we know a little more about the um, theory behind the content models that we've been analyzing, uh, why don't you just show us around and, you know, tell us how it, it actually looks like in Contentful. Okay, yeah, sure. So before this webinar, what I did is I have set up a space and I recreated the uh, two lookbooks in there. So Lena Dunham's A Nasty Girl is the one coming from, from The Nasty Girl and then Tales from Amsterdam is something that we saw on Mr. Porter website before. Uh, we'll go and look at Lena Dunham lookbook first because that one uh, represents a more complex approach. 
uh, which also allows you to create more flexible lookbooks. Uh, and then Tales from Amsterdam is a bit simpler, uh, but also imposes certain constraints on you as an editor. Um, before we start jumping through the uh, specific entries, what I want you to do is to imagine in your head a layered cake. Uh, so in that case, Lena Dunham lookbook is like three layer cakes. And we start with a base, and the base is basically a lookbook container entry type. And what it does, it stores all the meta information about the lookbook. So as you see here, you have a, a title, uh, maybe you would have a short description to go with title. There's a slug, which basically determines under which URL you will see this lookbook, publish date, cover image, and then most importantly, we have lookbook modules. And lookbook modules is basically nothing else but uh, specific sections that you saw in this bigger lookbook. Uh, so that's how they are represented in, inside this container. Uh, now, of course, what you want to do is uh, when you want to add specific sections, you either add a new one or you go into already existing one and then work with it there. Uh, but again, you know, in order to preserve that, what we do first is we have this intermediary content type, uh, which is called lookbook module. And you can see the name of a uh, content type here uh, by clicking on info button. And basically what module does, it stores all kinds of layout and presentation options that you might have associated with your piece of content. So let's look what we have in this case. Uh, we have a layout type and here we have several predefined ones. Uh, to give you an explanation of that, uh, the first three deal with um, representing pictures in a different way. So one up, two up and three up. It's a terminology which comes from the uh, print publishing. And what it says is that, you know, it's either one picture or two columns with pictures or three columns with pictures combined. Uh, then you also have uh, specific layout types for text, quote. Uh, in the case of text, you would see a paragraph text. In the case of quote, you would see, you know, highlighted uh, quote in, in big fonts uh, and stuff like that. And then you can also have credits uh, or content cover cell. So credits would be, you know, slightly more faded um, uh, font type and then content carousel you could put in some things which are supposed to be rotating and be shown one at a time uh, or all of them showing up uh, then again something like full bleed refers to how would you like your picture presented so in the case when you only want there to be one picture uh, you can show it with regular margins on both sides or you can make sure that this uh, picture is blown up as to occupy all the visual space on the screen. Uh, so that's what Full Bleed does. It basically controls uh, these modes. And then as you go further, that's when uh, the other things start. Uh, content slots. That's actually where you would attach specific content. Uh, you know. And as you see, content here is represented uh, by a different entry type. And that's done on purpose because the module is meant to uh, have all the configuration options uh, but not have any specific content attached to it. Promoted URL, uh, basically, you know, you might want to include a specific uh, link uh, which deals with a section uh, as in, you know, like here's the text and if you want to find out more, you can click through and uh, see the whole page dedicated to that. In this case, we are not doing that, so it's empty. And then finally, we have a uh, a field where you can attach specific products uh, that you want to promote and that are associated with this uh, you know, piece of content. Uh, and again, um, here we have some constraints imposed, so you can only attach four entries, you can easily mix the order of those entries and stuff like that, uh, create new products that you want to attach, or just go and look for existing ones uh, by clicking on this field. All of that is possible here. Okay. Uh, but now let's continue with our discovery of this content model and just click on uh, the actual piece of content which is attached. Uh, again, for the sake of the naming convention, uh, we can check that this is a content type which is called lookbook slots. Here you see lookbook slots, right? And uh, now we actually in the entry which is supposed to be everything about content. So you have a specific title for the content. You have embeddable link, which is very useful when you are, uh, again, want to make a picture or video or click through, or you just want to embed external video or let's say SoundCloud clip, you can just paste it here. 
Uh, on the other hand, like if you want to add you know, text, then you would paste text and stuff like that. Uh, photos, same story. Um, and then call to action would be uh, if you want people to do a specific thing uh, uh, related to this content type, uh, again, you can attach a uh, call to action. Some people uh, are wondering what, what is actually a, a call to action. It's nothing fancy. It's just a button uh, which says, you know, click here to get a discount or uh, register now to find out more and stuff like that. Um, but we just wanted to keep it separate uh, so that, again, designers could have control over how it looks like and editors at the same time could tweak uh, uh, the content that you have. So basically, now we went through all uh, Nasty Girl um, content model. And what happened is that we started at the top where we had a container. Then we clicked through to the uh, module. And then we ended up on the you know, lowest uh, entry type, which is uh, basically entries dealing with content. Um, now let's go back and look at the alternative approach to that, which would be represented by Mr. Porter type of lookbook. Uh, so we ha what we have there is only two layered cake, if we if we can say it this way. And again, we start with a base, which is a lookbook container, and um, there everything is exactly the same. You have this container type, which is basically meant to store all the metadata uh, and help you, you know, uh, add something like a cover image, a title, uh, attach individual sections and stuff like that. Uh, but now the biggest change happens is when you actually go lower because instead of having an intermediary content type which just deals with layout and presentation options, what happens here is that you have different types of entries which represent different types of content. So there is a predefined entry for photos, uh, another one for text, and so on. Uh, and those entries basically what they do is they fuse together content and the options, uh, presentation options that apply to that content. So let's click through the photo type of content. So once we open the entry, which is by the way uh, called um, section photo, and, and that's the way you know that actually this one is meant to deal with photos specifically rather than text. So when you look through it, everything is pretty much the same. Like you have a title, you have an image and then you can attach some associated products. You can attach a uh, call to action. Then you can attach URL as well. Uh, you can see that there are not many uh, layout and presentation options here. And that's done on purpose because the designers thought like when it comes to images, um, there is a certain predefined way the images are displayed and they don't want editors to be able to change that. Uh, now let's go back and actually look at how the text entry would look like in this case. So again, scroll down and find something like Eric interview, which would obviously be a piece of text and see how it looks like in practice. Okay, so again, we have a section title, uh, we have a text editor with an interview. Uh, you can see that, you know, questions were highlighted and so on. Uh, now we are in actually working mode. You can also preview that text uh, by just clicking here and then you would see roughly uh, how this text will be rendered outside. And then here you see there are some options built in. So editors can choose if this text has to be left aligned, right aligned, centered, uh, or should be presented as two columns, for example. Uh, again, you can attach call to action and promoted URL. So as you can see, the, the number of things that editors can do in this case is much, is much more narrow. And uh, you know, just to extend the analogy exactly the same way, you could create a content type which is meant to deal with uh, video entries. And in that case, for example, you would include options like um, should the video player be displayed in a 16 by 9 format or should it be 4 by 3 format? You know, do you allow pre-rolls to be displayed in that video? Uh, do you allow people to share that video and so on? So you basically craft a content type which takes all these options, takes the video and kind of makes it very easy for editors uh, to deal with it. So that's basically how the inner structure of uh, our content types looks like. And uh, just to stress once again, you know, for those of you who are wondering, uh, why can't I just see all these options on one page? Well, there are two reasons behind it. So uh, first of all, we want editors to, uh, to be able to work in discrete steps. 
so when you come up with a structure like this, what happens is that editors can focus on one task at a time. So first they are just dealing with metadata and thinking, you know, how this whole lookbook is going to fit within the existing website or with an existing app. Then they focus on some presentation details and uh, think about what is appropriate in, uh, in this context. And then finally, they can just uh, deal with a specific type of content. And on the other hand, this separational, uh, let's say, breaking down of, you know, of traditional page into specific chunks uh, also makes it much more usable. So as an example, once you define one author, you could easily link that entry in many different entries. Or uh, once you create a call to action, then you can easily add this call to action to different sections, even on the same page and stuff like that. And you don't need to uh, recreate that every time you want to attach that call to action, which in the end saves you a lot of time and effort and make sure that the whole presentation is more consistent. And if certain elements have to be updated, they can be updated only once and then the entire website uh, displays the correct version of that uh, element or of that you know uh, piece of content so that's basically the logic behind uh, keeping it um, separated and breaking down you know uh, bigger page centering content types into a smaller reusable chunks uh, so that's pretty much um, everything we wanted to tell you about how the structure of a lookbook uh, looks inside so, correct me if I'm wrong, but are we actually now going to see how it looks like on the website? Oh yeah, so uh, basically what we did, we asked our developer colleague to build a very basic uh, uh, front-end application, which, which is basically capable of displaying those logbooks. Uh, and we will include the link to that uh, application uh, with our uh, webinar notes, uh, so you can actually go and check it out for yourself. So as you see here, we have both lookbooks, um, you know, there's a title, subtitle, uh, the header image and so on. You can click through and then basically see the lookbook uh, represented on the website. Uh, much as in the original example, you have, you know, uh, image associated products displayed on hover. When you come to the image, uh, you have, you know, the introduction and then the interviews with a specific gentleman in here. So that's how, you know, uh, the Mr. Porter lookbook looks like. And now we can go and check out the Nasty Girl lookbook. Also very similar. So we have images, products associated with it, images displayed in different ways, quotes, and so on. So this is just to show you that, you know, all of this can easily be displayed on your website. Now, to also show you that what we build up till now, it's a fully functional uh, easily editable model, let's go into the lookbook and change a few things around and see how that reflects on the on the front end page. So let's start with Tales from Amsterdam. And just to illustrate how a typical editor would be working with his lookbook uh, through the process of creation, let's say now that we have a lookbook, we want to shift some things around. So uh, in this case, John and Abel is the second person interviewed and we think like actually he deserves to be the first one so we put him right before uh, before the Eric interview okay so we just move some things around what you need to do for the change to go through you need to publish it so now we publish the new order of interviews uh, it has been published so we go to the original lookbook we open it and if we scroll down We'll see that it has not updated yet, so we need to wait a few minutes um, until everything goes through, and then it should appear in the new order. Yeah, and now you see that uh, Alex is actually first, and Eric has been moved and is second. And this way you can basically move around any kind of element on the page. So we change the interviews, but you could also, you know, change the products, replace the products. So it's new products. Actually, in fact, we can uh, go and do exactly that. So if we open the uh, Jonah Abel entry where the products are referenced, and let's say instead of a slim cotton shirt, we want to remove that. 
and then we want to add something else, right? So we will look now for products and say that actually we want to reference maybe a denim shirt instead. So we selected the denim shirt. And as you see, like now, that the last item here is going to be the denim shirt. Again, we're going to publish our changes. Changes have been published. We'll go here, we'll refresh the page. And now let's see if we have a denim shirt attached. And yes, that is true. Now the last item is actually a denim shirt. So you see how easy it is to actually replace, drop in, uh, add new products in there. Now maybe let's do something uh, different and go to um, Nasty Girl Lookbook and see if we can change some options around there as well. So we open the lookbook. And what we're interested in, let's say, here we have the quote combo, right? So let's open this module. Again, so we have a picture and then we have a quote. Uh, what we want to do is actually we want to move them around uh, or maybe even just include two pictures instead of having a picture and the quote. So what we'll do then is we delete the quote and we will look for a different picture. So, for example, let's take this look. Again, we'll publish changes. Now, I'm not sure if this picture of the right size, so it might not work, but... So now we're going to open the lookbook. And what we had before was a picture of a quote over here. And now we should actually see a different picture. Again, we need some time for the page to refresh. And here you see, uh, we don't have a quote anymore, but we actually have two pictures displayed. So that's how easy you can influence the elements and move them around. And uh, change the sections. Um, yeah, and as I said, like we're gonna open source the this basic front end application that we built. So you are more than welcome to actually try it for yourself, play around, uh, maybe copy our content model, and then um, just learn, you know, to use and to control this uh, for your own uh, production needs. All right, and how can our users at home um, actually recreate one of these uh, lookbooks? Oh yeah, so the most exciting uh, uh, part of the journey. How do you actually create the um, content model for a lookbook? So what happens there is you have to have uh, administrative rights because otherwise you will not see this content type section. But then provided you do have these rights, uh, that's where you actually go and define the templates for all your entries and uh, determine you know, which fields go into a content type and so on. I think the high level task is actually to decide how many different content types you will have. So for example, uh, we saw that for Mr. Porter, uh, you would probably want to define a specific content type for photo entries and text entries and video entries. And uh, maybe you will also have infographics. Maybe you will have, you know, crowdsourced content where you want to show uh, tweets or Instagram pictures and stuff like that. So just determine what specific types you want to show uh, and then create content types for that. Uh, on the other hand, if you're going to go down the route that uh, Nasty Girl has gone, then you can simply create one universal content type for all different uh, types that you have, uh, just making sure that you have a field for you know text and photos and videos and stuff like that. And then kind of uh, fine-tune that uh, by, by also uh, building the module content type where you would uh, include specific layouts and presentation options. Uh, and there, of course, like you have to think through what makes sense, uh, you know, what kind of controls you're going to give your editor. So as I said, uh, first decide how many content types you will have and what kind of content types you have. 
and then um, just start creating them and adding specific fields. So let's you know see how it works in practice. Uh, here I would say lb test uh, just to keep it clean, and uh, it's always a good practice to actually include the description. This is content type for testing our logbook. You do that, and then the next thing that the application will ask you is uh, to define specific fields. So most probably you will start from adding some kind of title. So you just say, this is the title. Um, then the next thing you want to do is probably add a, a URL. Uh, so again, you would add the URL. Maybe you have some kind of description. In this case, we want it to be a long text. So we change it to long text. And now we want to reference some other entries. So actually, we use that and we say, and here we're going to include LB slot entries. And again, you have to say whatever you only want it to be one single entry or many. In most of the cases, it makes sense to choose many because very often you don't know how many entries you want to attach there in the future. So just to be on the safe side, we create many. And then finally, what we want to do is probably uh, add an image that you can attach. So again, we choose media, the same story. Is it going to be one image or will you be able to attach many? And we say many. And at this point, I would say you are done with the first step, which is determining you know, which fields and what type of fields go into this content type. Uh, now, before you go any further, um, save this content type. Uh, and what you need to do now is actually invest a little bit of time up front so that your content type is much easier for editors to use. And there are several specific things that you can do. So first of all, you can uh, go into specific fields and specify whatever you know they need to be localized or not. So by by checking this checkbox, you indicate that this field actually should be available in multiple languages, uh, provided your project actually uses those languages. Um, one specific you know keep to keep thing to keep in mind is that whenever you have metadata type of fields, uh, let's say there's a certain option, or you know you're going to include a URL and stuff like that those fields usually don't need to be localized. Uh, but pretty much any time you have a description, a text, you know, something that editors should be able to read in several languages, that's when you want to go ahead and localize that, uh, that field. Then um, another important thing to keep in mind is actually every time you run into the field which can break your application uh, just because editors put in uh, something wrong, uh, that's when you want to think about using validations. And validations is basically uh, the rules that you can define uh, to which uh, the input has to, con to conform. So one of the things that we can do here, since it's a URL field, we can say, actually, we would like this field to be a valid uh, URL. And here we choose URL, uh, which automatically substitutes a regular expression into our uh, field. And once we save it, from now on, Anytime you enter text into that field, uh, the Contentful is going to check that it's actually a valid URL before saving your entry. And now one more thing you have to keep in mind is also appearances. So while we store all these fields in a consistent way in a database, uh, to editors they can be represented in a number of ways. Uh, and sometimes uh, the representation of a field can actually help editors in their work. So for example here, if we're pasting URL, what we can do is use URL widget, and what it will do is basically uh, render immediately the content it finds under that URL. So uh, also to provide editors with some tips, we can say paste the link to preview the content, and this way we give them the idea of what's going to happen when they interact with this field. So now we created a content type, let's save it, and let's go and see how it looks like in practice. So we open our entries, and now we want to create a new entry of a test type, right? I'm not going to fill out all the fields, but what I want to do very quickly is just 
uh, grab a random YouTube video, say, and, and show you how URL widget actually works. So if we go to YouTube and we say we want to preview a video with Lennon Dunham, we choose any random video that, okay, Lennon Dunham on showing skin. We copy the link, we put it in the URL field. And what's going to happen is that preview widget now parses the link and extracts the content and renders it in line in, in your entry. So your editors can preview the, uh, the video without actually going out of Contentful and this way be sure that they're actually pa pasting the right type of video and they did not make a mistake, which would be very difficult to understand if you only had this URL uh, you know, to judge from. So again, to, to make it you know, live, you need to publish it, but uh, for now, I just wanted to illustrate how the process works, so I'm not going to do that. And another thing I just wanted to draw your attention to, I provided a small comment uh, helping editors uh, to know what to expect uh, when they paste the link. And as you see, the comment is appearing here. Uh, so that's pretty much everything you need to know about content modeling. As you saw, it's very intuitive. You don't need to know JSON. You don't need to be uh, skilled in database management and stuff like that. Very human, uh, very drag and drop and, you know, uh, very clear uh, options and configurations. Uh, presentable to you. So use it and experiment and you know we hope it's going to make your life much easier. Great. Um, so now that we know everything about content modeling, we are ready to Q&A. Oh yeah, it would be nice to look and uh, answer a few questions. All right, so we are ready to start answering some questions. Um, some questions already came in, so let's get started right away. What is the difference between Content Delivery API, Management API, and Preview API? Can you provide an example of where we can use these three APIs? All right, um, so the Content Delivery API is essentially the API that, um, you know, as, as the name actually says, it just delivers your content. The only, it's a, re, a read-only API, so the only uh, request you can do is basically get. Um, Whereas the management API is a completely separate API that lets you manage the content contentful. So if you would think about uh, the interface, it's essentially just a web app that interacts with this uh, with this management API and lets you, uh, you know, edit, manage, and you know, create and delete the content. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in terms of preview API, essentially it's just an API that fetches all the content, just like the you know, as, as, as if it was a replica of the delivery API. But just gets all the content that is in um, in draft mode as opposed to you know published. Now, next question: If you change content or reorder content, can you preview it without publishing the content? Well, um, that sort of uh, goes in the same direction as the previous uh, question. So, if you use the preview API, you can definitely preview the content, and then when you publish it, since you have a completely different access token, then you know, it goes. You know, you could have the preview API uh, plugged with your uh, plugged into your I don't know staging environment or preview environment, and then you know only the preview the um, the uh, delivery API um, plugged with your your um, you know public environment, and then you could actually you know have these two different uh, these completely two separate environments that you know in, in the preview environment you would then preview everything that's in draft mode, and then the um, you know, in your production environment, then you would see whatever goes live. All right. Um, if you create a new space, uh, do you have to create all document types again, or can you import them? Um, if you create a new space, uh, we actually have a script that lets you clone uh, content types. I will assume the document types are content types. Um, you know, there's a script in our uh, in our GitHub. Uh, repos that you know lets you uh, lets you essentially clone anything that is in one space to any other space of your choice. Can you show me how the slug field works? Oh yeah, sure. So maybe we'll start from defining the slug widget back in the our content type. So again, we can use the test content type we created, and I just want to show how it looks like when you are setting it up for the first time. 
So let's say, um, uh, okay, let's say like we're gonna use this URL field as our slug. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to appearance and then here you see it says slug widget. Uh, what slug widget does is based on the input in the title field, it will automatically create um, a slug which confirms to all the basic SEO recommendations uh, and is you know, of a limited um, length which strips out all the characters which are not supported by URL domain and so on. So we save it here and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our entries and we will open one of the entries and what happens is that the moment you create a new entry which has a actually field set to a slug widget it will auto generate the slug based on the time and date uh, and what you're gonna do is once you start writing it will be replaced by the input uh, which is created based off your title so if we say this is how a slug widget works and just to demonstrate we can also add some numbers and then some characters maybe which are not supported as you see um, us dollar sign was converted to usd just to prevent you know from any mishaps from happening uh, and then if you put some spaces they also strip down and so on um, yeah so that's basically how it works uh, automatically SEO optimized uh, based on an input that you have but then of course you have the ability just to go in and edit the select widget whichever way you want to uh, if you think that it's too long or you know maybe it's highlighting the words that you don't want to use and so on and then once you hit publish then your entry is public and then you can go and uh, find this entry under the URL that you just created and um, just one other thing that it actually does as well is that it checks um, in the same space for similar, uh, for exactly, uh, you know, matching slugs. So you always know that your URL is going to be unique. So that's what the red tick there. Oh, yeah. Is. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, next question. If content editors redefine content types, do front enders need to redefine the API? Um, okay. I think, you know, let me rephrase the question. So I think the question is referring to the fact if you're going to make changes to your content model, uh, does that mean for that content to work on your existing front end or within your existing app, you need some uh, developer resources and so on? And I would say in most of the cases, yes, uh, because what's going to happen is that uh, once you redefine the content model, you will probably adding new fields, uh, maybe you know, removing some fields, maybe adding new content types and stuff like that. And what it all means is that uh, for the sake of you know, stability and making sure that your application continues working, it's always a good practice just to go and check if those new fields are referenced on the front end and will show up there when you want them. Uh, or maybe you know there's some critical piece of a front-end infrastructure which is actually relying on the field that you just removed you know uh, in other cases uh, when you for example just adding meta fields which are only used for let's say managing content inside or for filtering content uh, within the web editor and stuff like that maybe then it's not essential uh, for you to involve that developer in order to make it work but whenever it's a customer facing type of content that you are adding subtracting you know modifying and stuff like that uh, then yeah then actually you have to sit down with developers or even designers and kind of make sure that uh, this updated content model you know fits and works well with your front end all right and next question is what are some of the challenges clients have with managing their content in contentful i think contentful is awesome Yet most have been conditioned to WordPress and Squarespace type of CMS. Uh, yes, that is true. Actually, I would say that a lot of questions from editors who are used to working with WordPress and other open source uh, CMSs, they come down to two different types. So uh, first we hear a lot of things about the difference between what you see is what you get type of editor and markdown. And uh, basically the one big complaint that we're hearing from editors is that they are unwilling to learn the tags which are required when you are composing you know, text in, in Markdown. And on the other hand, they are a bit unhappy about the fact that uh, 
they don't have a possibility to format the text as they want to, you know, change the color and the size of a font, uh, maybe structure uh, the text by including some tables or, you know, uh, including an image and then regulating, you know, how big that image has to be or how it should, should uh, be aligned together with text and stuff like that. Um, so obviously, you know, when you are used to working this way, uh, and suddenly you are given the choice of working with a Markdown editor. Uh, this is something that might, you know, uh, set you off. But uh, what we like to repeat and uh, bring to the attention of our customers is that uh, it's not just a matter of preference, you know, whatever you want to work with WYSIWYG editor or with a Markdown text editor, but it's a matter of making your content scalable and efficient and making sure that as you, you know, put that content onto new platforms and uh, uh, start supporting new devices. Everything you created up to this point can immediately be reused on those platforms and you don't need to worry about uh, something going terribly wrong just because there is a, uh, a piece of browser-generated code somewhere there which is gonna screw things up. Uh, so I would say that's one big topic that we are uh, seeing a lot from our customers is like this transition from what you see is what you get type of editors to Markdown. Uh, another thing that sometimes comes up, not, not so often, but uh, sometimes we do hear complaints about that, is that people a lot of times are used to work in this page-centric mode uh, where they would have you know, one page which contains all the elements that uh, are going to be published. Uh, and uh, once they transition to Contentful, they might be a bit thrown off by the fact that now you have to kind of adapt your workflow and start working with this reusable chunks of content, as we like to call them. Uh, so basically uh, taking the you know, traditional page and then disassembling it into constituent parts. So uh, for example, you know, offer would be in one entry and then as I mentioned earlier, category would be a different entry. Uh, whatever goes in the middle section, maybe you know, it's a third entry and then maybe you will have some related articles or uh, you know, um, other things that uh, have to be promoted in this context. Uh, so let's say calls to actions or, you know, some uh, excerpts from other pages and stuff like that. So all those things would be linked up to this page as separate entries rather than being found in, in the same page. Uh, and we think, you know, once you kind of start working with these chunks, obviously then people might be thrown off by the fact that they're not seeing everything in one place and they actually have to use filters and kind of navigate around uh, to, you know, complete their work in specific discrete steps as opposed to always working on one page and uh, seeing everything happening on one page. Uh, so I would say that is the second, uh, you know, complaint that we heard. Uh, and, you know, to the credit of our design team, they listened very carefully to all those complaints and in the recent months we have seen a lot of changes around our, around our user interface, which actually makes it so much easier uh, to work with this distributed uh, entries, which actually, in the end, uh, constitute one page. Okay, and uh, our last question. Uh, let's say a content editor wants to create a new landing page. The content editor will use the existing document types. Does a content editor need a front-end developer to get this content on this landing page? Or how is this API programmed? Uh, yeah, actually this, I think, refers to the main goal of uh, this whole exercise, I would say. And if you remember back in the beginning of the webinar, we mentioned that uh, the real challenge of, you know, uh, making lookbooks work for you, is not just being able to create authentic, fresh-looking, you know, lookbook, but also setting it up in a way that editors could do that without relying on developers. And I think this question refers very much to this point. Um, so, from the best practices that we saw, some of our, you know, um, most innovative leading edge uh, customers are, are doing and adopting, it's actually exactly that, you know, setting up the whole content model and, uh, you know, the whole uh, development environment in a way that the editors are empowered to create unique looking, uh, very different in content, in length, in style pages without relying on developers. So. Uh, it definitely takes some thinking, you know, uh, beforehand uh, when you're creating the content types, when you are thinking through how they're going to be related, when you are deciding what kind of presentation options to expose to editors and so on. Uh, but if you followed all the steps and actually, you know, created them in a way uh, to ensure maximum scalability, then 
uh, what's going to happen later when your editors are working on individual landing pages, then they should be able to create these pages without relying on developers at all. All right. Um, so now that we actually reached the end of our webinar, how are we going to share all of this, um, all of these resources with our uh, with our audience? Oh yeah. So uh, first of all, I hope you know that the webinar actually was useful for you and you. Uh, had a chance to learn a little bit more uh, how some of the leading e-commerce companies are creating lookbooks and uh, approaching this topic. And in terms of practical resources, we have already published a detailed blog post about exactly the same topic earlier on, back in October. Uh, we will also be open sourcing the front-end application that allows you to preview that content uh, and you will find it in one of our uh, GitHub repos. We'll also share the link uh, next to the webinar. And then, of course, you are more than welcome to just uh, uh, adopt our uh, content models, which we defined for this exercise, uh, which are also available as uh, JSON files uh, back in, uh, in the same GitHub repo uh, that you will see uh, shared. So you are more than welcome to use all these resources, experiment with them, improve on them. Uh, we'd be also very much interested in hearing about your own experiences, things that worked for you, things that are not quite working for you. Uh, maybe some points are a little bit confusing, so don't be shy, reach, reach out to us, and then we would be more than happy you know, to help you out with these things. Uh, and as a promotion for our future webinars, we also want to say that uh, in our plans is actually, um, we have a plan to, to conduct a few more webinars like that where we would be focusing on specific type of content and uh, helping you to understand what are the implications of structuring it one way or another uh, and hopefully leaving you with some best practice tips about you know uh, how to make it scalable and, and make sure that uh, your API is very responsive and scalable and so on. Perfect, okay. Um, now we actually reached the end of our webinar. Thank you all for attending. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, as Artis said, get in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.